roughly from the late 16th to the end of the 17th century. Agricultural production helped the growth of the industries based on agricultural manufacturers as well as the trade including overseas trade. As we all know, this was due mostly to the uniform system of administration and law established by the Mughals and long years of peace. But there is a problem of studying the agricultural production in Mughal India. The principal problem is the paucity of the contemporary sources. Even when the contemporary sources were there, there were contradictions within the sources. We can give one example of such contradictions. Three contemporary writers of the time of Akbar speak that there has been the cultivation of land all over the Mughal Empire. But when we come to the reign of Jahangir, Mutamad Khan, a high noble, stated that only one third of the land under Akbar was cultivated. This contradiction cannot be easily resolved. Then there is the second problem of uh, finding out the extent of cultivation as well as the average yield. For example, Abul Fazal had given the area statistics of all the provinces in detail except Bengal, Thatta and Kashmir. But in the area statistics of Abul Fazal, he had given the production figures in Bigha e Ilahi of Akbar. Now we all know that before Akbar had introduced the Bigha e Ilahi, there was the Bigha of 20 Kathas. Akbar in his reform of Bigha e Ilahi reduced it to 17 and half Kathas. During the time of Shah Jahan, this Bighai Ilahi was further reduced to Bighai Daftari, which was two third of the earlier ones. So, therefore, there is always the problem of computation and there is the problem of comparison. As far as the average yield is concerned, it is generally acknowledged by the historians that the average yield in Mughal India was almost the same as that of 1900. But a proper scrutiny of the sources has not yet been done, therefore one is never be very particularly very sure. India, as we all know, has artificial irrigation in different parts of the country from antiquity. And we also know that the principal production of India, whether it is pre-Mughal or Mughal, depended on monsoon. This artificial irrigation, which could be seen in different forms, was encouraged by the Mughal emperors not for charity, not for the sake of the peasants, but mostly for the sake of getting more revenue. Now, in the management of the water resources, the most important one was wells. Wells were formed the chief and the principal source of artificial irrigation in Mughal India. There were wells almost everywhere, some large, some small. In Bidar, we had been told there was a very deep well and there were different types of wells when we come to Mughal India. 
Babur, for example, stated the, the, about the steep wells, where the steps had gone down to the bottom. He had given a very good description of the steep well constructed by him in his Chahar Bagh at Agra. The problem of the wells is that the water goes up and down uh, depending on the season. Therefore, to get the water from the well to irrigate, not only for domestic use but mainly for the irrigation, one would require some sort of machines. In Mughal India, we know of three sorts of machines which had been commented upon by the contemporary European travellers as well. The first one and the most costly one was called Sakya, which the European contemporaries called Persian wheel. This is a structure with pindam gearing in a wheel with a pot or pots of chains and so, so on run by the bullocks going down the circle and the gearing helps the chain of pots to take water and throw it into the canal. This is the usual system particularly prevalent in Punjab and adjacent areas. The second one, which is called Charas, C-H-A-R-A-S, Charas, is a simpler device of ports and pulleys, but here also the bullock goes round, taking the water from the well. This one is possible when the water is near the sur surface. The third one, the Denkli, D-H-E-N-K-L-I, Denkli, is done by a lever system that is Chorus plus the lever system run by the bullocks. This is also possible by the water level is close to the surface. It is very strange that Abul Fazal did not mention much of artificial irrigation. But he stated that in Lahore province, Suba Lahore, there were large number of wells which cultivated the fields. Abul Fazal's statement of the late 16th century has been confirmed by an inhabitant of Lahore almost a hundred years later, Sujan Rai Bhandari. He more or less echoed the same. So therefore, wells which are found all over India, including Deccan, formed the principal part of artificial irrigation. But there were other methods. For example, the tanks and the lakes. The tanks had been there in India from antiquity. In pre-Islamic period, the Rajas thought it a religious duty to dig tanks, and tanks were there everywhere. In Deccan, they, there were many, and Buchanan Hamilton in 1800, in a survey in the Deccan, found a, a large number of tanks there. In this late 16th century, the Boshnobo poets of Bengal commented that there was a tank in every village. Even in between the villages, there were tanks. So tanks formed an integral part of the landscape in rural India. And from the tanks, one could come to the lakes, which are far bigger in appearance. Abul Fazal, for example, mentioned the Devar Lake in Mewar, 
which has been studied in detail by Ava Singh of Aligarh Muslim University in recent years, that the lake was 40 miles in length. It was, of course, uh, using the flow of water from the dams. We'll come to the dams later. But this kind of lake and tanks were there. Tavanir, in the middle of the 17th century, that the cultivation of Golconda is possible because there were a large number of tanks. Tanks therefore formed a, an also an important element in it. There were lakes also, for example, done by the rulers as well as sometimes by panchayats in cooperation by Mughal emperors. There was the Udayashagar Lake. There was the Rajshagar Lake, both in Rajasthan, one of about 12 miles, another about 2 miles to 4 miles. So therefore, the tanks and the lakes dotted the countryside, dotted particularly the drier regions, as well as the wet regions like Bengal. Now, the problem of the uh, tanks and the problem of the cultivation is that the rivers, they sometimes in the season flood the entire area. And the other problem was that the rivers often change their course. For example, Beas and Chinab, in their conjunction, when they meet each other, this conjunction has been changed to 23 miles also. The flooding of the rivers is quite common. Abul Fazal mentioned Sarju and Ghagra flooding the countryside. Now, as a result of this, large number of channels from the flooded rivers come out. And these channels, quite natural challenge, channels, they help the irrigation around, they fertilize the country, and they help the peasants in a longer space of time. But the problem is that there is, in the case of the flooding, there are the problems. But in Mughal India, when the land-man ratio was in favor of man, this was thought not to be a very major problem. Apart from these natural channels, there were the man-made canals. This had also been there in, to a smaller extent, both in the Deccan as well as in the Indus region, Indus water region, in Sindh, etc. But the Mughal emperors took some effort, made some effort to dig canals of long distance. For example, Shah Jahan excavated the canal from the hills up to Delhi, which was considered a, a miracle in those days. This was 78 miles. This entered Delhi in two ways, one going to the palace and the other going to the city. And even in the middle of the 19th century, one could see the canal flowing in between Chandni Chok and the Red Fort. But this was not the only one. During the time of Shah Jahan, another long distance canal was excavated from the hills to Lahore, 84 miles. And there, at that point, three more canals were excavated, going to three directions, including to Pathankot. So therefore, the canals also formed an, a very integral part. Actually, Feroz Shah Tughlaq had excavated a canal 
and on the west side of the Jamuna, and Akbar repaired it, and then uh, this canal was extended up to Hansi. So this kind of repair of canals and excavation of new canals were a continuous process in Mongol India. The only problem lies of the maintenance and supervision. The Mughals in the Lahore area had appointed an official, a high official, called Mir E. Ab, Lord of the Water. He has three principal functions. One, to create new canals. Two, to erect dams. And three, to see that the water is equally distributed to all the peasants so that there was no monopoly of water. So therefore, the Mughal government took particular care in creating the supply of the water resources artificially to the peasants, which certainly helped the growth of wheat and other productions. Now, there were also the dams. The most important dam was, however, beyond the Mughal Empire, but one can see the technicalities, the technology involved in it. This was the Melag Dam in Bijanagar, which allows the water from the hills to come to the city. As we all know, the palace of Bijanagar and the principal city was quite distant from the river. And therefore, this dam and the flow of the water through the canal is important. There were sluice gates, which were most there in almost all the dams, either in Bijanagar or in Mughal India. But in this case of Malag Dam, this was supported by rocks, rocks or stones of heavy weight, each weighing 20 tons, supporting the sluice gates. So there was a good deal of civil engineering involved in this. One of the principal problems of these canals from these dams is that sometimes the canals are lower than the fields or sometimes they are higher than the fields. Now the Mughals, while excavating the canals, tried to adjust these problems and they managed to do it to a great extent because in Lahore or in Shahjanabad in Delhi, there was no dearth of water. The water was coming quite regularly through the canals. Now in looking at the management of these dams and etc., how much this cost, this we uh, do not know. How much the area it helped to grow food, that is also not particularly known. But it must be from looking at the length of the canals from looking at the wells and the tanks and the lakes, it is certain that this is not inconsiderable. Inconsi the peasants in India, according to the European, contemporary European travelers, were of the same skill and methodology as used by the European peasants. The peasants in India, they have their separate fields and those who have their fields were known as khudkast and those who do not have their fields and were employed by other peasants, they were known as pahikast. In Mughal India, despite the land available, there were quite a good deal of 
peasants without land because they don't have the investment to buy cows, plows, etc. The peasants in Mughal India knew certain technology. For example, they knew the transplantation of rice, the technology of it. They knew the cotton dibbling by which the cotton is separated. They knew the seed drill by which the products are grown. So therefore the question of the peasants in India being backward does not arise at least up to the end of the 17th century. They were at par with the Europeans. But there was a difference. The European observers mentioned that the Indian peasants do not use the iron tooth in their plough. In Hindi it is called fal. That they do not use. The principal reason is that iron is very costly. It's beyond the cost of the peasant. And secondly, that the ground is more or less soft and therefore there is no need to really to use iron tooth in the plow itself. But the pe peasants by and large work hard, produce good food, produce good production and they helped the Mughal administration do, to a great extent by paying revenue. Like the days of British India, or even in modern days, there were two main zones of crop. One is called the rice zone, and the other is the wheat and the millet zone. The rice zone, generally, in a strip of land in the eastern and the western coast, but there is a rainfall, it's wet, and then in Bengal to a great extent, and even in Allahabad to a certain extent, and in Kashmir these are very well known. Actually, Kashmir does not, in the Mughal period, produce wheat, contrary to the layman's point of view. They principally produce rice. Now, in case of the wheat, this is in the drier zone and millets, that is jowar and bajra, they are also far higher drier zones. So therefore the zones are more or less determined, more or less separated by the climate, not by the wish of a particular person. But rice is more or less grown in various parts, even in some parts at Rahilkhand, in some hill regions like Kashmir, and also in other places. But wheat is the main central plains where these are done.